Welcome everybody. I'm Selena Resvani and I'm so thrilled you're joining Women and Work Culture, all about positive ways that we can engage and retain and include women at work. Um, I, we are talking today about a subject that's very close to my heart, which is supporting women of color at work, ways we can boost them and amplify them. And I am joined by a very awesome guest today, an inclusion expert, Stacey A. Gordon. She is CEO of Rework Work. What an awesome name and mission, by the way. And she's my fellow LinkedIn learning instructor, too. Hi, Stacey. Hi, how are you, Selena? It's so great to be here. <laughs> I'm great. I'm great. I've been looking forward to this conversation, and I'm so yeah, happy to too. have you. <laughs> You have worked, Stacey, with so many cool global organizations to open up their eyes about unconscious bias, right? Those preconceived notions all of us are walking around with in the world. Clearly, you know things, and, and we're going to get to those in one minute and ask you a little bit to pull the curtain back on those sessions. Yeah. Um, before we do, I want to ask our friends who are joining us today to drop us a note. Let us know where in the world you're joining from. Um, drop us a like and a location because we've had a lot of cool uh, areas we've covered from Dublin to Detroit, from the Philippines to Portugal. So we're excited to have you today. Let us give you a proper welcome. All right. Um, I want to ask you, Stacy, about these really important unconscious bias sessions you run. Yes. Um, you know, for somebody who's never been part of one, who, who's never had this as part of their workplace, tell us in a really impactful session, how is that different? How do you know, wow, there's a breakthrough happening here in this organization right now? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things and, um, um, you know, consultants always say, oh, it depends. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you, you can you can feel it and, what comes, you know, I'll, in this time right now, it's tough because we're doing a lot more virtual training. Um, but our virtual training is just as impactful as our in-person training. And I know this because we've had clients where we've done both because we've had to do in-person because we were close and then we did virtual for their other offices that, you know, were around the world. And they were surprised at how we were able to to replicate what happens in the in-person um, sessions. And I think what you see is reluctance. Reluctance changing from, um, you know, to openness. Mm. And that's really what the goal is in these sessions is to increase awareness and to get people to be more open. We're trying to get people to, to just see uh, see people differently, see, actually see people from different points of view um, and, and hear them, you know, hear the, the struggles that they've had and hear how it's impacted them and also hear how they can, can actually make a change and greatly positively impact someone else within their organization. I love that. Both that you can do it virtually and still make an impact, which is awesome. Um, but also the fact that, you know, it's about creating little openings. You know, it's not always the biggest, most dramatic shift. It might be that closed minded person opening up just a little bit or just right. a little bit more. Uh, I love it. I sometimes think of that, call that beginner's mindset. You know. Well, and it's the, you know, so you and I both know we have courses on LinkedIn. And so I get so many, especially right now, LinkedIn, um, you know, the, the, the viewership is up because people are at home and they have mm -hmm. some time and the courses are bite sized, right? So people can do a little five minute course, move on, do 10 minutes, move on, come back to it later. And what I get is um, I probably get 50 to 100 people a month 
who send me messages. It's gotten, you know, it's kind of crazy. But what I always find funny are the the individuals who will send me messages that say something along the lines of, um, you know, I was mandated to watch your course by my company and I thought I was going to hate it or that it was gonna be crap. I actually had someone write that. I thought it was going to be crap. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And they said, but you know what? It was really good. You changed my bias, right? And um, and so that's where I realized, I'm like, yeah, we did, we made the difference. That was what the goal was. We took that's, someone who yeah. was completely reluctant, did not want to do this, and had them realize that you know what, we're not here to call people out. We're not here to you know uh, make people feel bad. We really are trying to get everyone um, on, on a page where we can interact be a little more kinder and nicer and more respectful and more open. That's awesome. And I think in some ways, those experiences where we're surprised, where we went in thinking it's going to be one way and we're surprised, stick with us even more, kind of stay with us even more. Um, I want to pivot and talk about women of color specifically. And I want to ask, are there certain experiences you hear that are, you know, very common from women of color in some of these sessions, maybe the top two, the most common two you could think of. Yeah, and it's funny because I I, I was, you ask that question and it's hard to answer. (laughs) And the reason that it's difficult to answer is because of the work that I do, right? I'm brought out to help increase diversity, to conduct unconscious bias trainings, to open people's minds. When I sit in those sessions and I I facilitate those workshops, what we find is there are very few women of color. Hmm. I can't give you (laughs) those stories because the companies we've worked with have, we've done a lot with tech companies in the Bay Area um, and and they're just not there. And that's part of the problem, Hmm. right? Is that they're not there, they're not represented. Well, and that's so important because, you know, back to opening up people's mindsets, right? Sometimes one of the ways you open up people's minds is for them to hear someone's experience who's underrepresented, right? Or about that time they felt diminished or less than, you know, that's so important to hear those things. So it is. And and that's where they get those stories from me, from our other consultants. I mean, if you look at the consultants that we work with, we are diverse. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we are able to to share those stories. But what we also get them to see is to share their own stories of diversity as well. Right. And see that we we have that that commonality in that we all have aspects of, of diversity. And we talk about the diversity dimensions. Yeah, well, and we know there are some really unique experiences for women of color from everything from being less likely to get a job they apply for, right, which you know all about that recruiting phase as well, Um, you know, to getting the promotion, to getting the top pay. There are a lot of things that make this experience different, being a woman of color. I want to geek out for a minute on a few numbers um, that stood out to me. And, and here's what they're around. White men in this country make up 31% of the population. So just 31%, but they make up 75% of Fortune 500 boards, right? Mm-hmm. Only one example of you know where a lot of power lies in this country in businesses is at that top level. And I think for a lot of us, myself included, you know, when you grow up, you get a picture in your head of what a leader looks like, right? And when right. they share, uh, you know, a certain look, 75% of them look the same way, right? You start to almost have like an idealized leader or a model leader you're used to. Well, of course, the issue for women of color is we look the exact opposite of that model and that example, right? Can you talk to us about some of the pressures for women of color to kind of downplay some of who they are to fit in or to lead. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that, you know, I always think of the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? 
And so when we, we are told that if you want something, you've got to go out there and you've got to ask for it and you need to demand it, right? But women in general are penalized for doing that, right? We, we know the statistics about women asking and advocating for themselves. They are usually then, um, you know, then considered bossy and mean and demanding and all the negative stereotypes within an organization. Um, and so the, the, the alternative to that same um, phrase is that the raised nail gets the hammer, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is we get taught that the squeaky wheel, we're, we're not getting the oil. We're gonna be the, the raised nail and we're gonna get the hammer. And so we stop raising our heads, right? We stop um, asking, we stop standing out because every time we do, we get the negative. Um, and so that's what is happening within organizations. And this is why, you know, it's so easy for people to say, oh, you know, Stacy isn't as, as outgoing as everyone else, or she's not, you know, if she hasn't asked for this, then we're not gonna give it to her. Not realizing that, well, I haven't asked, because if I do, I, we have this this double bind, right? Um, and so it, it's it's one of those reasons that we do need to create uh, a workforce where people can advocate for themselves or where others can advocate on their behalf, right? That's where allyship is so important because I can't advocate for myself and get what I want in the same way that somebody else can advocate on my behalf and be successful at it. Yeah, that's huge. And I want to, I'm saving up some time to talk to you about being that good ally, or even sometimes being the bystander watching something play out. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But I want to stay on this topic of downplaying, like you've talked about. And I think what you said is really powerful. You know, you stop raising your hand or you stop speaking up because it's not always a good thing to get noticed. It's not always right. a safe place, right, to feel real noticeable and out there. Um, I know Deloitte, my old employer, did some neat research on this and called it, coined a term called covering. Covering. When you cover a part of your identity to fit in. And I think for women of color, we're sometimes talking about this confluence of a few identities, right? Maybe right. it's your race, right? Maybe it's your gender. Maybe it's something else, your class. You know, who knows what else is uh, coming together with that? Are there things you think that workplace cultures can do to promote a, a, a kind of culture where you don't feel the need to cover? Yeah, and I, I you know, I think we we have to think through um, if we think about the current situation again, right? How do you cover when you're on a Zoom call and we are being required to be on camera all the time? So this is a perfect example of okay, your workplace maybe you don't make it a requirement that people be on camera because maybe they don't want to be on camera because they don't have a quiet space uh, where they can, you know, not have somebody else in the background or their children, you know, crossing back and forth or a partner who is on a different shift from them and needs to change, right? And it's like, we just, we, we just assume, we make the assumption that everyone has access to space and technology <laughs> To, um, to be able to participate in the way that we demand that they participate. And we really have to ask, is that necessary? Do I need this person to be on camera? I love that. And, and, and why do I want them on camera, right? Do I want them on yeah. camera because I really wanna see them? Or do I want them on camera because I don't believe they're actually working unless they're on camera? Yeah, I love it, kind of extending trust First of all, that you do you. I trust you can participate in the, the way you need to today, right. um, you know, to keep your well-being or your sanity or whatever it is. But right. I, I think that's great. Suspend your ideas. Hold your ideas loosely 
about what everyone else's home life right. is or like. Well, you could even just ask, right? You know, yeah. you can ask, is everyone comfortable being on camera? And say, it's okay if you're not. Mm. I love right? it. I because love it. we make such assumptions about things. I actually had to tell someone, I said, you know, you want me to be on camera for this 15 minute call. Why? Like, if I'm going to be on camera, I have to get up and do my hair. Now, I twist my hair at night. So um, it takes time for me to twist it. Mm -hmm. It takes time for me to untwist it in the morning. And you want me to do all of that for a 15 minute call? That's, that's important. That's burdensome to me, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I should be allowed to refrain from having to be on camera. I'm like, phones still work. <laughs> Yeah, we right. can have it's like, a phone call. <laughs> what's NBD to you, no big deal to you, might be a huge, tremendous deal to me. Right. Um, and by, you know, the flip too, of course, right? What's right. not a big thing for you, you know, for me might be a major thing for you. By well, the and way, it's also getting, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, we have people listening to your great advice from Alameda, California, Austin, Alexandria, Virginia, Costa Mesa, Washington, D.C., Tampa Bay. Awesome. Please, hi, I everyone. Wanna, yeah, <laughs> hi, everybody. I want to take this moment, too, to um, ask you all, send your, your questions to Stacy if you have them around that experience of being a woman of color at work, and we'll try to get uh, some responses to you and get your question asked in this time. Yeah. Well, going back to what you said about covering too, and, and again, I, I use the this current time that we're in as an example, you know, I would sometimes, I have like a little house dress that I wear around the house, right? And I bought one in, um, in Dubai and it kind of looks like an African print. Um, but it just, it was, it just, you know, an old house dress kind of thing. And I was walking around in it and I sat down to get onto a call and I looked down and I thought, oh, hmm, I probably need to change, <laughs> you know? And so it's just little things like that. Or I do have a headscarf on my head and I think, ah, dang it, still have that on. I need to take that off. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's, thinking through those kinds of things and i get it like we're having a conversation today i'm not gonna sit here in a hoodie and a t-shirt right and my hair not done i think we do have to we we still have to look at when it's appropriate like if we're having a meeting we need to treat it the same way that we would if we were going into the office for a meeting right mm -hmm. we, need to, we actually need to get up wash your face put on some makeup if we wear makeup <laughs> and, and and get ready. And so I think that that's part of it too, is that we, we might be working from home, but you've got to decide, am I working right now or am I at home right now? And make that mm -hmm. distinction. And I think we've been conflating the two a lot. <laughs> Yeah, well, this is a kind of perfect segue into something I wanted to ask you about, especially because we were talking about some of the ways we physically present in this world. Um, and it's code switching, code switching, you know, that term maybe more and more people have been seeing in headlines and newspaper articles. But what is this kind of sibling issue to covering code switching? What is it? What's up with the pressure for women of color to code switch. Yeah, well, and I think that, so that's kind of the example that I gave about changing, right? What, what mm -hmm. I was wearing. I, you know, I might walk around at home looking one way and if I was getting on a call with, I actually read an article about, I wish I could remember it, but it was a, a woman, a black woman who said she was getting onto a call with other black women, they were all professional, but she said, but they were all wearing headscarves, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it was, it's, part of that culture. And so no one looked at them funny and thought, well, why are you wearing that? And, and she said it was so freeing to be on this call and to be able to uh, participate in this way. But I did that knowing that I was going to be with other black women mm -hmm. and it would be okay. But I couldn't do that if I was going to be on a call with non-black women because it wouldn't be received in the same way. And so that's, that's literally a, like a visual example, right? code switching um, is really it's looking at your environment and, and figuring out what do I have to do to fit in, right? Mm. What It goes back to that raised nail kind of a, a scenario, but 
what do I have to do so that I'm not going to stand out in a way that might be negative or might potentially be perceived as negative? Yeah, I think that's so important. And I love your visual of that call. It sounds so liberating <laughs> to be on that call and just be yourself without, right. you know, uh, you know, it's expensive, I think, psychologically to all of us to be calculating and wondering and calibrating and trying to put something across just so, right. you know, so that it's comfortable for everybody else. It It's exhausting, right? It takes something out of us um, to do that and to try to fit in. Um, I just also want to say, you know, I think we're not just taking cues from work life, which we are, when we see leadership and it tends to look a certain way where we don't see a lot of women in color of, of color leading in many organizations. I think we also take those messages from other parts of our life as well. Um, how to assimilate. I grew up in my own situation with a dad, um, an immigrant uh, from Pakistan, you know, very heavy accent, very dark skin. And he was very open with us that that was, he felt less than, you know, he felt less than white parents, he felt less than wealthier parents, you know. Right. And I think sometimes we also take those messages about how to fit in or assimilate from personal role models too in our lives. What we, right. how are we seeing them handle it and manage it? You know, not right. just what we pick up at work. Well, and sometimes it, we, t we take that a little too far, right? Like that is where we do have to take some personal responsibility in terms of how we show up in the workplace because we spend a lot of time wondering how is somebody else going to perceive me? And I think I've finally gotten to a, a place, you know, or I'm getting closer to a place where I'm sort of over asking that question. You know, I was like, I'm just, I'm going to show up. And then if there is a repercussion because of that, that's because of their bias and their issue and not because of me. And I have to be ready to um, to actually fight for for that and say, you know what? I came, I showed up, I did what I needed to do. You reacted in a negative way. And now you're trying to, you know, take that out on me and and, and cause me, you know, harm in, in my job, not gonna stand for it, right? And so I think okay. what happens is we for so long have had to stand for it and have just said, oh, well, that's just the way it is and that's just how it's gonna be and that's just what it's like at this organization. Um, but I think that, you know, Me Too and Time's Up and things like that have been examples to be able to show that, you know, we don't have to stand for it anymore. We don't have to take this kind of treatment um, and we really have to, we, we have to, to say something about it, right? I love it. Can we shout what you just said from the rooftops? I think that's so uh, empowering, really, and freeing to say, to hear you say, I stopped doing that and I showed up. And and um, thank you for that, because I think you're inspiring a lot of other people to take that same step. Um, and I can't say I do it every day. Like I said, I still changed my shirt the other day. So it's like, yeah, you're, right. you're like, you're, you're weighing you, you, it's a constant weighing of mm -hmm. how am I going to show up? Who are these people? But you, the, the more you can get comfortable with, this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm good at what I do. There's value in what I do, and I deserve to be compensated appropriately. Um, it it makes it easier. The more you do it, the easier it gets. <laughs> awesome. So we've talked about that kind of. Uh you know, urge to maybe cover up a part of yourself. We've talked about code switching where you're taking it past just the urge to cover up and you're actually doing a behavior to change how you show up. Maybe it's speaking in a different dialect. Maybe it's wearing a different outfit. Maybe it's wearing your hair a different way. We've talked about those things. In your work, have you seen workplace cultures that are healthy and strong, where people don't need to code switch, you know? And if so, what what are they doing differently? You know, what's even one or two things they might be doing differently? Yeah, I mean, I think every culture has good and bad, right? Um, there is no perfect culture out there. Um, but the fact that 
I think what is important is being open and transparent about that and saying we are not perfect and we know we, we need to get better. We want to improve and being open to feedback. Um, so I think companies where they are listening to their employees, I love when I go into an organization and they say, well, you know, we think that, that our employees need X training. Really, based on what? <laughs> what is that based on? Have you asked them? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, have you actually asked your employees what they would like, what they might need, how they feel about any of this? Um, and I think that that's an important thing because, you know, I know companies love to do these grand employee surveys, but at the end of the day, you could ask one or two questions, get the answer, and then implement it instead of asking 40 questions, getting back all of this data, taking months to sift through the data, and then doing nothing with it. <laughs> I love it. I love how you're describing like simple but but incredibly important traits in a good healthy culture you know that you're open you're humble you're listening right to what people have to say i love that um will you tell us in uh, while you're pulling back the curtain on your sessions and uh you i know you do this really cool exercise where you reveal to people their in group can you tell us any more about that exercise and, and what you want to hit home to people? Sure. So it, it actually started, I started doing this years ago. Um, and again, you know, LinkedIn and I, and I have had this relationship because I've, I've just loved LinkedIn when it got started, right? I was one of the very first people to have a LinkedIn account. And I was recruiting back in the day, working as a recruiter. And so I just happened to... Um, kind of take a look at my LinkedIn profile. And you know, it used to show you, I think it still does in a certain way, but the way they did it back then was different. And they showed you this, like who your closest um, or most connected people were. And I took a snapshot of it. I don't even know why I did that at the time. But when I looked at it, I said, wow, all of these people kind of look the same. And I thought, wow, I'm out here talking about, I'm a diversity recruiter because I've always been, that's my thing, it's always been my thing. And I said, well, how is that really, how am I a diverse recruiter when there are so many people missing from my own network? So what I started doing was having people do that, was just look at their network. But there is actually a formal exercise that I, I found a couple of years ago um, that kind of takes that same concept into play. And so what you're doing is you're looking at, you know, if, if you were to write down the top five people that you go to for advice, when you need, um, you know, business advice, really good, solid advice. Who are those five people, right? And then if you write down the name of like your five best friends, and you write down the name of, um, let's say, your five, you know, also like trusted advisors, and you start to get a pattern because then you look at it and you go, well, do these people are they all the same race? Are they all the same gender? Mm. Are they all the same ethnicity? Um, are they all in the same age group? Uh, do they all live in the same geographic region? And you really, it's eye-opening because, you know, like I said, a quick way to do it is to literally just go to your LinkedIn and do a snapshot of like who's in <laughs> your circle. Yeah. Um, but if, if you do both of those things, it will tell you a lot about the circles that we navigate in because we like to think that we're open and we're diverse. And, oh no, we love everybody. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. <laughs> You really don't. <laughs> right. That's not who you're spending your time with. Um, right. <laughs> right. And so yeah. it's just, it's looking at that and seeing that, wow, yeah, you know what? I need to do better. And then actually doing better, right? Actually reaching out and meeting, talking to new people and making those connections. That's awesome. I love it. Kind of, this is your in group. What an eye opener, I think, for most people. I want to ask you one more question, Stacey. Um, you know, I'm a believer personally that women of color's contribution, leadership is under recognized. Are there ways that you think we can amplify women of color and, you know, better celebrate their leadership? Yes. I mean, I, oh my God. So again, so simple. Like that is literally my mantra is everything is simple. You just have to do it. So uh, you're putting together a panel 
of leaders include a black woman, an Asian woman, a, you know, a, a Latina woman, include somebody who's different. If you put together a panel and they all look the same, please, please, please change them out. You're doing a panel, you're doing a speaker series internally, organizations, you're, you're putting together a project and you choose the project lead. Who have you chosen to even be part of this project? It's like every single time you have the choice, you get to make a decision about who is in and who is out. It's literally that in-group, out-group mentality that you are perpetuating every single day. And you have to choose to bring somebody from your out-group in. If you can do that, you need to do it in leadership, you do it in your friendship circles, do it in, in everything. And uh, if conference organizers, as you're picking speakers, you're creating these speaker series, like you said, in internal professional development, you're trying to decide who's gonna come in and do a training. There's so many opportunities to, um, to look at, at leadership and, and bring in some new faces. I think that's those are such good reminders to keep widening your in group and you know that's our challenge for you all today. I want to add a few others which is, you know, attend events like this one where women of color are speaking, you know, or hosting. Listen, right? Listen generously so you can hear a new perspective. I think another great one is have a one-to-one -one with a woman of color just to get to know her and broaden your in-group to use Stacy's term, you know, have that deeper relationship uh, with a woman of color in your world. And the last thing I'll say is this, you know, catch people doing good. See people doing great things and tell at least three other people about how she's demonstrating leadership. Yeah, we actually you know? do a, a, a Simply Good newsletter every month for that reason. We're like, here's all the really good stuff that's happening. I love it. <laughs> I love it. This is so good. Well, I love that you're tackling such an important topic. You know, we all have this one go around the world and you are encouraging people to extend their capital, their clout to other people. And yeah. I think that's such a beautiful, wonderful message. And I just you, want to say, too, by extending yeah. it, you're not, nothing is being, yours is not being reduced, right? Like, that's also something that people think, oh, if, if I extend capital, it's taking something from me. No, it is increasing for both of you, right? You're multiplying. So I just want to make that note as well. I think that's great, right? You don't have to be threatened and scared that it's only finite. There's only so much pie on the table. No, right? right? No. Uh, doesn't work like that. In fact, it multiplies, I think, usually when you give it away and when you lend it out. Um, you are so awesome. You have so many superpowers, and I appreciate you sharing them with us today, Stacey. Thank you. Thank um, you. I hope. Oh, could you tell us quickly where people can find your great podcast and reach out to you? Yes, actually, I just have it all posted at my website. It makes it easy. If you go to reworkwork.com, you can uh, check under our resources. We have the podcast listed. All the courses are linked there as well. And um, you can always email me or find me on LinkedIn as well. I accept awesome. all requests. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy, And thanks to all of you, our community. I'm sorry today there was a little lag in being able to see your real-time questions, but I promise we'll keep getting to those. Uh, please stay in touch. Join the newsletter tribe uh, at selinaresvani.com slash sign up. Uh, check out the LinkedIn learning courses. Follow me on Twitter. And for all of you, I hope you stay healthy. I hope you stay well and lead on. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you.